morning. Thanks for having me again. I, uh, I was asked to review a little bit of um, what's coming, mostly with non-transplant approaches to uh, this condition. And although, as you know, I'm a transplanter, I'm kind of going to try to uh, make the case for not transplanting these patients. And uh, obviously, at the end, there is no clear-cut answer to that. And uh, that's my, uh, my charge. Um, so this is obviously a question, not a statement. But you know that, and here is a, a little list of a, a few trials that show constant improvement compared to the pre-TKI era and then post-TKI in the outcomes of uh, Philadelphia positive ALL. You can see here the Korean study, the Japanese study, uh, and uh, the graph uh, 2003. And, uh, Hypercivad and then Hypercivad with imatinib. You can see here the complete remission rates, and then the second column here, the proportion of transplant, and I'll come back to that, and the, the survival before and after the use of uh, uh, imatinib mostly here. Now, the problem with interpreting the whole literature with this is that the proportion of patients, patients who are transplanted varies a lot. And uh, in general, there is a huge selection bias, meaning you think like me, oh, this is a younger patient, has Philadelphia positive LL, I will transplant. But that 75-year-old who has Philadelphia positive LL is not transplanted. So this literature is completely biased. And this has preventing fully uh, randomized trials, if you will, because of that intrinsic bias that we all have. But that's just a fact. And you can see here the, the proportion varies a lot uh, uh, in terms of in, within these studies the proportion that was transplanted. Um, this is uh, the uh, Yanada uh, paper from 2006. Essentially, again, show for patients who did not receive a bone marrow transplant in that cohort, on those two cohorts, uh, you can see the difference in, uh, I believe here on the left is event-free survival, on the right is uh, overall survival. And here are for those who did go into to remission and then received an allogeneic transplant in first remission. This is event-free survival. This is survival. Uh, um, this is mostly a, a cohort of young patients here. A anyways, in here, a pediatric slide just to uh, uh, contrast, but again, the same uh, um, uh, trends, if you will, with here uh, unrelated and related donor transplants. Uh, um, so. You heard from uh, Dr. Richard before me that obviously MRD is king here and can help us. I'm not going to elaborate too much on that, but this is obviously the ideal model for us to monitor. The catch is that not always the kinetics is that predictable as it is in CML. Very often you see the molecular relapse, and that may be very fast in your face. But, but this is uh, a, a study uh, by Lee that suggests that MRD kinetics at the end uh, are two courses of chemo with imatinib uh, will help you separate transplant outcomes as well, meaning um, the ones with, without MRD do better or with less disease do better than the others. Anyways, so what's happening in the meantime? So especially the MD Anderson group has been incorporating different generations of uh, um, tyrosine kinase inhibitors to the hyper-CVAD regimen. And here is uh, uh, Ravandi reporting on dazatinib. Okay, this is uh, what, 70 patients. You can see the CR rate is not that much higher than the uh, historic CR rate. However, now you start seeing this overall survival. These are adults with a medium age of 55. But here is again the problem. A significant fraction of these patients end up receiving transplant. So the interpretation is limited because these are the younger patients that were selected naturally to go to transplant. Uh, um, be that what it may, this is uh, what Ravandi reported uh, after a medium follow-up of uh, almost three years for patients. And keep in mind that a significant fraction of them were transplanted. Now, what about ponatinib? So our friend Dr. Jabour, who I believe uh, left, 
um, has been investigating and uh, has reported this also as an abstract. And you can see here in this color, uh, it's ponapinib, 45 milligrams daily throughout the regimens. You can see here this uh, kind of grayish bar here on the top. So he reported on 34 patients in which they added ponatinib to the hypersivad regimen. And uh, um, where do we go here? So four, medium of four cycles, 14 are currently receiving maintenance. Six of the 34 end up being referred for transplant. Again, the, the, the bias that you have to build in this uh, analysis. CR rate now is 100%. And uh, uh, he, they found MRD in 91% of these patients. Um, no early death. And uh, now with a median follow-up of nine months, so it's significantly less uh, follow-up than the previous slide that I showed you. He has 32 patients uh, alive in remission. One-year progression fee overall survival uh, rates are 100% and 86%. Again, with a much shorter follow-up, but I would suggest that this curve is going up somewhat with more intensive uh, uh, um, TKI. Keeping in mind my two caveats, again, approximately 20% transplanted and uh, relatively shorter follow-up. Now, also Kim, uh, also during ASH 2013, reported the addition of nilotinib um, to uh, 91 patients receiving chemotherapy. Here the median age is 47 years. And uh, you, you can see CR rate about the same at 90%. A mortality around 9% in a molecular CR uh, at hematologic remission of 55% and two year survival of 70%. So these are impressive numbers. And uh, obviously, you talk to a guy like me, I'm going to say, well, transplant, this is a classic indication. But at least I think we're all now charged with thinking twice. All right? This is some, uh, this is a, become a complicated decision. And it gets more complicated because of the following. So this is a well-designed, uh, uh, well-conceived uh, study. It's an intergroup, um, multi-center study in the United States in which uh, a genetic randomization is attempted. So uh, Philadelphia positive ALL, age less than 50, um, good, good transplant material, if you will. They are to receive the hypercivad regimen with the zatinib. If you have an unrelated donor sibling, so a sort of a genetic randomization with uh, unrelated donors uh, included. Uh, and then subsequently proposed maintenance with the zatinib for the transplant arm. What is happening to this trial? Exactly what we just saw with the other smaller trials. Uh, all the investigators are in, in, including here younger patients and the, so the bias will always be there because we're so it's not, uh, uh, I believe this trial is not accruing that well. Anyways, so let me change gears so there is no answer to the question I just uh, formulated. It's conceivable that one can, as you heard, use MRD here uh, to help you guide on this decision, right? I mean, those who are molecular not in remission could conceivably uh, be your best candidates for transplant. However, you saw that also the ones who have persistently uh, or large amount of Philadelphia positive disease prior to transplant also do slightly worse uh, in transplants. So it's a little catch-22. So now, let me change gears after transplant. We discussed this a little bit yesterday in the context of transplants for CML. Uh, do we need maintenance afterwards? And then with which one and for how long? Translation, there is no answer to neither of these three. MRD can help you, as we discussed yesterday uh, during the CML uh, discussion. But, but here's what we have. So there is a, 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 a paper by Chan uh, in which suggests that this is beneficial to do maintenance after transplant. This is retrospective, not a prospective study. Uh, um, and this is imatinib. And uh, you can see here that a significant chunk of patients had to stop it. This is actually something to be careful about, starting uh, uh, TKIs very early after transplant. You've got to be cautious there. Um, but then the survival uh, relapse rate, I'm sorry, was smaller, and the free survival was better for those who uh, received maintenance. 
At, at the same time, you have rams and cabriais, uh, which is uh, 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 us at MD Anderson at the time, or not us. I think I have an identity crisis. Uh, I'm not there anymore, but <laughs> them, us. Um, a cabriai with 82 patients here that I now show this data a little bit. Retrospectively, this was a uh, dealer's choice, so we, we decided not to because there was not a clear-cut pattern to it um, and didn't show benefit, did not show benefit. And I'll, I'll elaborate a little bit. And again, you can make a case here for prophylactic flat or a preemptive approach, as we discussed yesterday. I'm not going to elaborate too much on that, meaning if you have uh, increasing levels of uh, either uh, be cerebral, et cetera, your marker of choice by flow or uh, uh, PCR, you could intervene. Um, but it's not a straight answer, as I, I just mentioned. So this is, uh, uh, um, um, needless to say, having MRD disease uh, after, uh, minimal residual disease after transplant is not good. And it's possible that doing preemptive treatment would prevent relapse. Now, what type of triazine kinase inhibitor? Again, there is no answer to that. Um, as everything else, there is a trend towards using uh, a second generation here without uh, a clear-cut um, reason for that, but conceivably. It's interesting just to remind you that tyrosine kinase inhibitors have a variety of immunological effects that, interestingly enough, could help prevent graft versus host disease. Um, but again, this is our uncontrolled studies and all that, and, and you probably uh, are aware that there are some uh, investigators using TKIs to treat graft versus host disease as well. So that's an interesting uh, consideration. So duration of TKI after transplant, again, um, patients sometimes become addicted to it, right? I mean, they're afraid of stopping it, uh, and I'm too. And so. I think it's reasonable to say take it for two years, a year and a half, boring, two years, lifetime, uh, who, lifetime, I don't know, no answer. Um, my uh, rule of thumb that for patients who come to transplant not in a pristine CR, I just let them take it. And until there is a toxicity of some sort, it's lifetime. Uh, you may criticize that either way. Um, but don't know the answer. Um, this is uh, Dr. Cabriai's MD Anderson data. It's historic data. Um, you can see here that for those who received maintenance, it's small, relatively small numbers, and those who did not, the curves do not uh, show anything. Right? It speaks for itself. And she published this in uh, Biology of Blood and Marrow Transplantation. So in conclusion, I. Uh, Dr. Anderson sent me a slide. I just remember that I did not add it here. My first line here is something I did not discuss in my presentation, which is, I think, for the first time, due to the work of Dr. Anderson and Parto Cabriai, um, we are seeing a regimen that, in my opinion, will end up replacing TBI. Um, again, this is another dogma in transplantation that uh, total body radiation is absolutely necessary for the treatment of ALL. This has been challenged uh, by uh, Anderson and Cabriai by using clofarabine in combination of intravenous brusulfone. So it's a very ablative regimen, very antileukemic, if you will, uh, because of the addition also of clofarabine and without added toxicity. So I, I unfortunately don't have a slide on that. It was not the objective of my, of my presentation. However, I, I want to highlight that. Um, Post-transplant TKI, yes, as I, as I said, I think you have to be careful when starting very early because we'll do cytopenias and you may see a lot of uh, uh, fluid retention in addition to your uh, usual side effects to TKI. So be gentle and, and ease your way up with them. And the, the ultimate question, do you transplant or not, um, I think more and more we are going away from uh, that, that old um, statement that we would accept very high rates of treatment-related mortality because now we are being challenged 
by treatments that do not include transplant, i.e. The, the addition of the tyrosine kinase inhibitors um, to chemotherapy. Uh, oh, today my picture is showing. These are my new buddies uh, that are freezing in Cleveland now. Um, at least I'm not there freezing this time. <laughs> and here, just uh, I want to acknowledge Elias. You folks know KBRI is not here. Dr. Ravandi, her husband, by the way, who are not here, who helped me a lot with the slides, and this is mostly their work anyways. Uh, ah, and this is my hometown in Brazil. This is a Portuguese colonial architecture you can see here that you may remember in Macau, if you've been to Macau, it's kind of similar, my mail there. So uh, thank you very much.